OK, so I, I think there's some kind of delay in the schedule, but we're going to get started anyway. Uh, so hello. Uh, my name is Florian Loretan. I'm with Wunderkraut. And I'm going to start this presentation with a question. So who here is doing work with Drupal 8? I know everybody asks this question. OK, some people. Who is doing work with, uh, with other people? Who, uh, who do Drupal also. So who has colleagues who do Drupal work? OK. And I guess most of these will be working with Drupal 8 at some point. Yes, OK. Um, yeah, so we're, we're in the same situation. Uh, so at Wunderkraut, we have a lot of employees. We have 174, five, something like that, uh, employees throughout Europe. Uh, Two thirds of those are, are Drupal developers experienced developers, and that's where the, the hundreds uh, comes from. Um, and so we are in, this, in the middle of this process of just uh, upgrading to Drupal 8 and not upgrading in a technical term, but in terms of uh, organization. What do we need to do to really get there to the point where we don't have 100 Drupal 7 experts, but where we have 100 Drupal 8 experts? Um, and the, this is a slide, I, I, I copied this pretty much from, from every presentation I have, and this is a, a question that, as an organization at Wunderkraut, we like to ask very much, why? Um, why do we want to upgrade to Drupal 8? Why do we want to do Drupal 8 in the first place? And um, I think it's, well, people assume that uh, we are, well, we are a Drupal shop, um, and so yes, we are, I mean, Drupal is, uh, in our roots, so to say. Um, but for us, it was not necessarily straightforward to say, well, we are doing Drupal 7, so we will do Drupal 8. Uh, we are, by all definition, a Drupal shop, but we don't think of ourselves this way. We never meant to be Drupal only. It just happens that it's a very good tool. But about one year ago, um, we, we were a little bit unsatisfied. Uh, we were working with one technology that was at the time already four years old that had not been moving so quickly. There was a vague new version coming up. Um, and there were a ton of things that the solution that we were working with was not good at. One of them was building applications. Um, and so what we tried, well, what we did is uh, we, we tried out different technologies. We did some great stuff with Node.js. We built a lot of really cool stuff with, with Angular, also did some experiments with Symfony. And the problem that we had there is that, well, there's a big investment to try out these new technologies. And then just because we can build something that's cool with it, it doesn't mean that we can maintain it years and years over. It doesn't mean that we have the expertise to have it in production with exactly the same kind of quality that we would have with Drupal. Um, and so we were at a position where we asked, well, what do we want to do? How do we put all these things together so that we can do the great kind of work that we do for Drupal customers and do more application-like stuff? And so what we did, we called Captain Drupal. Uh, well, no, not exactly. Um, what we did, um, we did a, what we called a, a technology task force. So we got some lead developers from all the different offices that we have. And we got together. Um, and the, the first problem that we wanted to, ask, uh, to answer is, well, what do we want to use as an application framework? Because we get a lot of requests that are really interesting projects, and we want to have something that's a good solution for that. The other kind of secondary problem that we had is that, well, uh, Drupal, or at least what we had from Drupal, is great for building medium to high complexity sites. But it's when we're building simple stuff, it's actually very complex. Um, and even very complex projects always have that small part, the About Us page. The, the, all the, these little things that, that suddenly take a lot more budget um, than, than what is really needed. And we realize we're not happy with this uh, because we could be doing better work. With. And in this round of discussions, there's one, one thing that um, a colleague of mine said, and, and it really stuck with me, is 
he said, well, Drupal, it's a good tool for, for doing site building stuff, for creating websites, you know, like the views and panels and content types. It's, it's great. And actually, Drupal is also a pretty good API. It has good framework. Um, of course, with Drupal 8, it's gotten better. But at the time, Drupal 7 was already pretty, pretty good. The problem is when we mix the two, when we try to do programming with site building components. And that's just something that, that it, it works, but it doesn't scale at all. And it results in terrible things. But in the process, we decided, well, maybe we will give Drupal a chance. And around the time, said so that was um, that was around uh, March, we tried our first Drupal 8 project, um, and it w we fell in love. And it was like, hey, this is actually really great. Um, it's not fully ready for everything yet, but this is something that that we could use. But before we trained everyone to to do Drupal 8 work. Well, there came the question, well, how do you, how do you sell Drupal 8? Um, because, I mean, it's, it's useless to have 100 people who, who know how to build something if you can't sell that. Um, and a couple of months ago, we did a, a sales workshop where I was working with, with all our, our salespeople. And what we came to the conclusion is that, well, Drupal 8 fixes our problems. Looking at it from like more pessimistic perspective, Drupal 8 is a bug fix release. Everything that you can do with Drupal 8 from a customer's perspective, you could do it with Drupal 7, even with Drupal 6. I mean, there's really nothing to sell in Drupal 8. Um, yes, you have WYSIWYG in core. Well, we had WYSIWYG before. You have REST APIs. Well, we had that before. It wasn't so good, but I mean, you, you had it. There, there's really, I mean, what can you do? And if you look at most of the Drupal 8 sites that are out there in the wild, I mean, you, maybe someone just changed the changelog file and pretends that it's Drupal 8, but I mean, there's, the functionality is not what makes Drupal 8 like, so nice. The thing, though, is that Drupal 8 fixes our problems. It, makes, it means that we can do deployment a lot easily, more easily. We have consistent structures. We have very useful APIs. Um, and so it fixes our problem, and so it is our responsibility to educate our customers and to tell them, well, we want to use Drupal 8 because we're going to be more productive and we're going to deliver better quality. So that's the why. Why we want to do Drupal 8 because it is a better tool to do greater stuff for our customers. Um, so what? And I'm going to go back to the, um, the, these two parts. Well, there's the... Well, maybe the three parts, the site building part, the coding part, and the gray zone. So the site building part, if you look at it, um, so that's Drupal 7, that's Drupal 8. Um, yeah, not much has changed. And actually, that's a good thing, because it means that the concepts that were there, and the concepts in Drupal 7 were, were actually very good, and we've kept those. And it means that if you are a site builder, just switching over to the new system is not going to be that different. I mean, if you knew how to do work, there's some differences, but like, it's really nothing confusing. Um, actually, it's a lot more consistent. So site builders will probably have a much easier time finding their way around the system today than they did um, well with Drupal 7. So that's with Drupal Core. Um, I also did, this is a recurring theme throughout this conference. Actually, this was the the, the presentation before, um, I did a very um, scientific study, uh, and you see that with Drupal 7, you need a lot more country modules than for Drupal 8. Um, and that's a good thing. It means that with fewer modules, there's fewer things that can go wrong when you need to update. It means you have lower maintenance cost. It means that you have less complexity. These are all really good things. And there's a lot more that you can do with Drupal Core and it's, it's good. <clears throat> so site building, not much a change, but a big improvement. For uh, Drupal, the application framework, there's actually this, um, this description that I found on a blog post a couple of years ago, and 
unfortunately, I was not able to find that blog post, but they had a very appropriate, very accurate, accurate description of the typical workday of a Drupal developer. And it looked like this. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's actually true. And what we see with Drupal 8 is that, um, and this is something that I have experienced, and this is a, something that I hear a lot of people telling, that all the people have started working with Drupal 8, um, it, it's fun. You know, it's, uh, Drupal 8 is something that is fun to work with. Um, and I think many people in the Drupal community have different backgrounds, but we all want to be good at what we do. We want to be, you know, fulfilled, and we n want to know that we are doing things right. Um, and Drupal 8 helps with that. Um, I had a lot of conversation this morning about, uh, well, programmers versus site builders. That's also true for site builders. Um, but overall, um, it means that the people working on the project can be happier. And I think I'm pretty sure that this is something that is not just because of the change. It's also something that has some value in the long term. And happier people are more productive. And more productive people means that, hey, you, it's you know, money, profit. Um, so that's not the goal. But actually having that as a side effect, it's something that's quite nice. <clears throat> also, it means that since in in Drupal 8, everything is object-oriented. Um, everybody should get a PHP Storm license if they want to. Um, you really get a lot of benefit out of it. So if any of your colleagues says, hey, I would like to, uh, to buy a PHP Storm license, make sure that this happens. It's a good investment. Um, and the reason why it's a good investment is that, well, you get all the autocomplete stuff, and this means you don't need the documentation anymore. You don't need to jump, well, I'm going to look on Drupal.org what this thing does. It's just like you're, you type and you say, I want to get something. I'm not sure what's available. You type get and you have everything there. So it means that the learning process is hugely increased. And this is something that, uh, that we see um, the, the learning process for people who were not familiar with Drupal at all. Before we used to estimate around six months is the time it takes from being not familiar with Drupal to being actually, you know, really productive and knowing your, your way around really well. And what we're seeing is that <coughs> uh, with, uh, with Drupal 8, this, the switch is actually very fast. It's a lot faster than people expect. So really within one week, we have, well, within one day, people figure out their way around and within one week, they're productive and they've reached the productivity levels of, uh, of what they had previously with Drupal 7. And what's really interesting is that we're seeing that um, Symfony developers have also something similar. So you take a Symfony developer, you put them on a Drupal 8 project, and within a couple of days, they can actually be very productive, um, which is something you could not have said of Drupal 7. There's new tools like Composer, and what Composer means is that you can work with contrib modules and other libraries in the same way. It means that, well, if you need the devil module, just install that with, with, a, with, a, <clears throat> with Composer. Well, you can say, well, Josh made use, uh, used to do that. But what's nice is that you have exactly the same mechanism. For example, if you want to work with Elasticsearch and use Elasticsearch directly, uh, instead of using Search API, for example. So you really have access to a lot, a much wider um, set of, of integration tools. <clears throat> something that's, that's something um, th that's very important to think about, uh, that's a very nice concept, is, well, simple versus easy. Historically, with Drupal, we've always tried to make things easy. And that means we want to make things clickable. Um, we, uh, and at the same time, this approach has led to things like the views UI, which is definitely, well, it's easy because you can click, yeah, but it's hugely complex. Um, and maybe we need to take a step back and we want to make things easy, uh, we, we, do, we want to make them simple before we make them easy. It means a good example for that is search. You can either 
installed the search API module, and that's just an example. I, I have nothing against the search API. Um, but you can install that. It's a module that has a thousand lines of code. And then to be able to get exactly what you want out of that, you're going to write your hook form alter and hook alter something, and that's going to be 100 lines of code. And maybe if you use the Elasticsearch library directly, which is nicely maintained, very stable, fully object-oriented, you use that in your custom code, and you write the same 100 lines of code, but instead of b those being overrides of configuration stuff, um, it's just going to be the thing that you use. And so we need to revise this, this idea, well, um, if it, it's in contrib, so it, it doesn't cost anything, so it, it's really going to be much more effective. Sometimes you want to have something that's more simple, that you build with simple components, and that's going to give you something that's really direct. <coughs> and the nice thing is that when you work with, with these service-oriented architecture, uh, be it with outside third-party services or um, the services you build yourself. I'm talking Drupal services, not like web services there. Um, what's nice is that suddenly everything is testable. And it means that, um, well, we, we did some testing before. But now, because everything is testable, it means that it's going to be absolutely a best practice to write tests. And it means that anyone who does professional Drupal development will have to be writing tests on a regular basis. So we're, we're seeing some changes, and, and these are not necessarily the tools that we need to learn, but we need to have the processes to integrate those kinds of tools. One of the things that we looked at early on um, was, well, we have Drupal, and there's also Symfony. And now the two are actually quite similar, so we actually have the knowledge to, do, to know how to do Symfony. Um, and so maybe we would do Symfony projects and we would do Drupal projects. And what we realized over time is that the answer when we were thinking of these kinds of setups was also, well, was always, actually, we want Symfony components, we want Symfony ways of building stuff, but there's no reason not to integrate that into Drupal. So what we're seeing is that we're now building the kind of projects where you use the, the whole uh, the whole tools that Drupal provides out of the box, and you create your custom components and put them in inside of a Drupal project. Um, so you can just have your block or your page that has like something that's fully custom, like with custom controllers, whatever integration you want, you might want to have, um, and you can still just have it as a drop-in component that's going to be placed and mixed nicely um, with your. Uh, with the rest of your application. <coughs> and that leads us to uh, Drupal the gray zone, uh, so the part between site building and programming. And if this was Drupal 7, we would call it um, Drupal the ugly part or um, the part where things went wrong. The thing we like to talk about, the, the analogy that we like to have for Drupal, we always talk about Legos. Yes, Drupal is a big box of Legos and you can build stuff with it. And in my opinion, if you look at uh, a lot of Drupal 7 sites, um, they look like this. Yes, they're Legos um, and they build on some, yeah, there yeah, there's some interesting patterns. Some of them which we called best practices. And as I mentioned, we looked a little bit outside of the Drupal world before switching to Drupal 8. And we saw that, well, if you have best practices that, only best, that are only best practices for your system and nowhere else, uh, maybe they're not such best practices. Um, a good example of that is, um, well, we use views a lot. And people have been using views to, um, well, to, to get content out of the database and then use use that in code. So if you try to explain that to a non-Drupal person, so, well, we create a view. A view is actually a SQL query which is stored in the database, OK? Um, and then you export that SQL query to serialize PHP in a 
in a function that gets called at some point, that's the features part, and then uh, it's going to replace the SQL query that's stored in the database when you deploy that. Um, and that's our best practice. Um, you think, uh, okay, um, that's interesting. Uh, to put it in nicely, uh, to, yeah. And, and that's the reason why a lot of people uh, who are very, very good developers have stayed away from Drupal. Uh, because there's things like that. I mean, you can really scare people off with things like that. And, and what we see with Drupal 8 is that if you do it correctly, there's nothing forcing you to do it correctly, but it's now possible to have some nice hierarchy, some clear abstraction layers. So that at the bottom you have the core system. So all the, the, the low level stuff, like the, that's where the Symfony components come into play. And then we have, um, well, the Symfony core component, uh, HTTP request handling, menu routing, and all of that. And then you have the modules. These could be core modules. These could be co core uh, contrib modules, or maybe even custom modules. It doesn't really matter where they're from, but they create stuff. They create components that can be reused. And then there's a configuration, and the configuration takes care of these components that you've created in code and puts them together. And, and then there's the theme, which just makes everything look pretty. And so it's important, and I think it's, this is a, a good guideline. If you want to build stuff correctly, make sure that you follow this hierarchy, that you have some dependencies from the configuration on, your, on, on modules. If you have a module, that depends on specific configuration. You're probably doing it wrong. So there's cases where you want to do that, but generally, uh, if you want to create, to do a list, uh, well, to query the database for a list of entities in your module, then use an entity query. Don't use like a view that you are, will export and then, I mean, that, that just spread things out in multiple places and it mixes your, um, it mixes your layers together. and you will end up with something like this um, with Drupal 8. So Drupal 8, you can still do that. You shouldn't. And now it's possible not to do that. Um, and in the end, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you have a lot of configuration. This is, would be like more of a site building, site building heavy uh, site. Maybe you have a lot of presentation with fewer modules. It doesn't really matter. But you still have the possibility to have a clear structure uh, and something that's where, where things stay together because they're stacked appropriately. And now comes the how. Um, so especially when you have big teams, or not necessarily big teams, but a lot of different teams, um, <coughs> you, uh, you will have uh, different kinds of people. And it's important to know that not all people um, have the same needs or the same readiness to work with new technologies like Drupal 8. So you need to make sure that you address each of these needs in an appropriate way. So there will be the, the few people who are really eager to, to, to come to contribute and to, to learn. And what you want to do, you want to support exploration. You want to send people to events like this one where people can really learn, learn about how others are doing things. <clears throat> And I think the, the presentation this morning, the keynote, was really good. Um, that, yeah, don't limit yourself to your own community. Um, because after the third Drupal camp, you're not going to learn much new at a Drupal camp. If you go to a Symfony event, maybe you'll learn a lot more. And so I would encourage you to just reach out. And I mean, there's like, um, these look uh, actually quite friendly, despite being Symfony developers. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you go there and you have people who work with this on the same kind of projects uh, as you do. Uh, they're really nice people. They're, um, yeah, this is really something that will be really fantastic. And we need to keep in mind all this Symfony stuff is new for us um, because, well, we just, I mean, we, we've been working with Drupal 8 for a few months, maybe a few years, but really not that long. And there are people out there who have been working with this technology for 10 years. And by reaching out to these people, we can really you know, figure out what works 
from the people who've done it before without having to make our own mistakes and really, well, learn everything from scratch. Another thing that you want to do is, well, you want to question the current practices. If you think about it, well, Drupal 7 was built, was released five years ago, um, and it was three years in the making at that point. Uh, so actually the, the concepts that we have in Drupal 7 are eight years old. In terms of web uh, age, that's really, really old. Um, and we need to, to question that question all the practices that we have and look at each piece, each item in our tool set and say, well, do I need that? <clears throat> uh, one of them, I mean, is uh, features. When you, when you talk to people about doing Drupal 8, they ask, well, so how do you do features? It's like, well, you don't. The only reason why you ever did features in the first place was um, was to, to deploy stuff. And, well, I would say, yes, there's that little star that says, if you want to build a distribution with reusable components, you should use features. For everything else, forget about features. You don't need features. Um, and people, like, even when the, you, they accept, okay, well, we don't need features, but how do we bundle configuration? And you realize, well, why would you want to bundle configuration? Um, if you look at a site, a web project, Everything is dependent on everything most of the time. I mean, there are some dependencies, but um, it's an illusion to say, well, we have this article A, and then there's this other section, and this one depends on this one. And if you look at all the stuff that would break if you were to disable one of those nicely put together features, well, yeah, no, your web, your project as a whole needs various stuff. So um, maybe you don't need to bundle functionality in things like that. Um, and the configuration management uh, exported files already have dependencies, already have all the metadata to keep track of what can be kept track of. Um, so maybe there are some, not only the features module, but the concept of features that say, well, we have this stuff and this stuff, and we're going to put it in folders. Maybe even concepts like these we need to get rid of. Another one is installation profiles. Uh, who used to do installation profile for every project that they did? I did. I think there's a lot of people who did that. Um, I've actually given a presentation where I said, this is the way to do it. Use installation profiles with features. Um, I'm sorry about that. <coughs> and um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, and with, with installation profiles, I think the, the people who raised your, their hands, the reason why we did it was not because we wanted to have an installation profile. The reason is because we wanted a way to create a, fu a fully functional instance um, based only on code without needing to exchange a database. And so we were using a tool to solve something that, well, it wasn't meant to, to, to to solve, and, and now we have better solution. For example, the config installer. Um, so yes, don't use installation profile. Um, unless, again, little star, if you're building a distribution, in which case it makes sense because you want to, uh, to let people say, well, I want to create an, inst an installation that does exactly that, and it comes out fully, uh, fully fit for that. There's other tools like Drush Make. Um, yes, Drush Make is better than nothing. Um, but it's it's also really a, a terrible tool, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, use Composer instead. And there's, there are points, uh, things like that we ask ourselves, well, um, how do you do patches? Because in DrushMake you could apply patches, and in Composer, well, well, actually, the quick answer is yes, there's a Composer plugin that lets you apply patches, so if you want to do that, you can. And the longer answer is, well, actually, the only reason we have patches is because that's the outdated workflow that we use on Drupal.org. Uh, and if you look at most of Contrib now, it's actually built on GitHub that's kind of mirrored to, to, uh, to Drupal.org, and the contribution actually happens with pull requests. And, and Composer actually supports that very well. Um, so you need to kind of not only say, well, I want to apply patches, but to follow these answers these questions a little bit further to say, well, what are the best practices? And for anyone who's been doing open source work outside of Drupal, this 
pull request workflow is something that everybody uses. And so it, it means that there are a lot of things that are not Drupal specific that you want to get familiar with. You want to keep a very open mind and look around what are other people doing. And, and these are the models that we should be using. At the same time, we have new tools. Drupal console, who has used Drupal console? Okay, a few hands. Okay, I think if you are using, uh, if you're doing work with Drupal 8, use Drupal console, it will make things a lot faster. It lets you, for example, generate a module or generate a config entity um, <coughs> or a content entity, and it will just create the, the like the, the tool that, well, it will create the, the, um, the boilerplate code that you need, and then you just put in your, your own functionality. And this is really important, um, not only because it's useful, but this is something that's really sim similar to the Symfony console, which does exactly the same thing. And so when you're working with new people, and yeah, we're, we, we will be hiring new people, we will be working with customers that have their own developers that also only have Symfony experience. If we can show them tools that are familiar, not only to us, but to everyone, this is something that will make adoption a lot easier. The reason why we want to settle on these tools, even though there are some details that are still being worked out, is that we want to seek consensus now. And one of the problems that we had at Wundercrowd is that we have teams that are distributed. We have teams in different offices, actually originally coming from different companies. And we ended up with Drupal 7 with a lot of different practices, people who were using um, display suits, some others who were using panels, some who were using the two together. Um, no real consistency there, and that's just one example. And now that we are picking the new, the new tools, we have a way to, see, to, to reach consensus. And if you want to make sure that two years from now, your different teams uh, will have a consistent solution, and if you want to make sure that your solutions are consistent with what the community is doing in general, you want to make sure that you are seeking consensus, you are seeking alignment uh, with others. And that means that um, a, a good example is how do you set up a project? So you do your Git checkout, you have your code base, um, what do you do next? And there are some cases, well, there's uh, a series of steps that's in the, in the documentation. Sometimes you have a script. Sometimes you have a Capistrano setup. Sometimes Jenkins take care of that. Sometimes it's your hosting environment. Um, and, and this is really difficult because it means that as people are moving from one project to another, suddenly, well, you need to learn, well, I have this code, but how, how do I get this code running? And what we have now is that we have Composer, and so we run Composer install, and Composer can actually run, trigger uh, different things. Um, and we always have Composer for every single like, Drupal 8 project, and then maybe it will, well, what it will always do, it will install third-party code, so contrib modules, libraries, things like that. Um, but you can also cause it that to trigger to the compilation of your front-end code, like running uh, gulp or whatever you use for your front-end tools, uh, you can use that to trigger the import of your database, uh, not the, the database, the import of your configuration using CMI. You can run database updates. So it means that no matter what project uh, you are working with and no matter what the project needs to, uh, to do to deploy a fully functional site, uh, you still have one command. And that means that, well, if you want to understand what that command does, you can look into it. But you always have a single starting point, which means that uh, this is something that, that makes sure that the, um, there, there is a lot of consistency and that everybody works in the same way and that people who ca can join your project and just know what, what needs to be done uh, without a lot of knowledge transfer. So now you have a few people who are working with Drupal 8. That's great. You have a couple of projects, and, um, but not everyone has been working with Drupal 8. And that's the time where you want to make sure to expose everyone. So not everyone will be working with Drupal 8 from the very start, but you want to make sure that they hear about what's going on. And for us, it was the decision to kill our Drupal 8 
chat that we had internally and to just say, well, we're going to put everything in the Drupal, uh, in the development chat. Um, even if some people are not working with Drupal 8 yet, they should be hearing about that. Um, and so, yeah, make sure that you talk about the work that you do. Don't be like, hey, this is really great and working on yourself. Make sure that you, you share the love, you share the anger too, share what works, what doesn't work. Um, you really want to make sure that, uh, that people have get a feeling before they're even working with Drupal 8. They, they should be getting a feeling, hey, what is it like to work with Drupal 8? Um, and I think part of this is, well, there's, uh, it has to do with reassurance generally, because people are scared of switching over to Drupal 8. There's a lot of new stuff. There's object-oriented, there's this configuration management stuff, which we don't really know exactly how it works. There's this and that. Um, there's plenty of reasons to be scared. Um, and then in the end, it's actually not that bad. Uh, but people need to know that it's not that bad. So re you really want to, to expose, to give, um, to give a feeling for what it's like. And the biggest reason why, why people are not switching to Drupal 8, it's the unknown. And very often people would prefer to work with th the solutions that they know doesn't work that well with Drupal 7, because they know it doesn't work that well, but it's a known thing, rather than try out Drupal 8 and think, hmm, well, I don't know if it might work or might not work. And so the, the unknown is scarier than like the things that are known to be bad. So encourage people, and this is really like reaching towards the end of the adoption rate, encourage people. Let them know that you know there's nothing to be scared of, and actually it's a lot of fun, and make sure that you, you, you don't put pressure, but that you show the, all the reasons why you like everybody really wants to work with Drupal 8. So give some good motivation. Last summer, at the beginning of the summer, I set a goal for, um, for our company. I said, by the end of the year, we should not do any new Drupal 7 project. And I'm quite happy with the outcome. I've been doing a lot of outreach internally, just showing, sharing how we've been doing, making sure that the people uh, who want to go to conferences really have the possibility to go to conferences, that we send different people like in different places to really be ready. And I have to say, well, at the moment, we have reached that point, actually since about two months ago, that we are not doing any new Drupal 7 work. And the reason for that is quite simple, is that, well, there's, there's different kinds of projects, but if they're small, then actually, do, it's possible to take the risk to do it with Drupal 8. It's a managed risk because the project is small. And then if it's a big project, then it's a big project. So it's, the investment is worth it to actually make sure that you do the thing right and that uh, it's going to really be a good investment in the long term, both for you and for the customer. So that is my presentation. And it's a work in progress. It's, um, it's what we have at the moment, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, I think eventually they will probably merge. I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there's, um, well, Drush has a big history. So it, it has legacy code to support like Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. I'm not sure if it still dr supports Drupal 5, but um, there's a lot of code in there. And I think the, it's probably that the things that Drush used to do will be moved into Drupal console little by little. And at some point, it might, I mean, I'm not sure if, like in terms of naming who will win, but I'm expecting that we will see uh, the kind of Drupal 8 object-oriented code in, in, uh, in a console style uh, kind of tool, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I think, 
and and we're, we're I mean Drupal 8 is released now it's a stable version but there's still a lot of things that will be changing and so um, and, and that's also something that we we spend a lot of time making sure that um, well the projects that we built in back in in March and April that we kept them up to date because we knew that these first projects will be the project that people look at uh, when they start their other project and say, well, how did we solve it back then? And you want to make sure that these examples are up to date so that people start with the right best practices. Uh, so we've, yeah, so make sure that if you have, a, for example, a deployment script that uses Drush and that you know that you're moving everything to console, make sure that you spend some time to do the maintenance, especially in the early phases of, of the adoption of a new technology. Yeah, good point. Yes. Uh, no, we are not doing Drupal Commerce projects. Um, well, so the Drupal, uh, Drupal Commerce part, uh, I'm going to answer that, and then the, the more generic part. Um, so Drupal Commerce, actually, we've. Um, we, we like uh, Drupal Commerce, but we've seen that, for, especially for larger um, projects, it's not always that ideal, especially if you have multi-currency, multi-country uh, stuff. It's it, it just not up, up to the task. Um, and we see that the plans for Drupal 8 and Drupal Commerce 2 are really good. They're really convincing. They seem to, to solve all the problems that we've had. Um, and at the moment, if, if it's a big enough project, uh, with Drupal Commerce, we will wait. And um, so th we have, th this means that we have a gap in our Drupal Commerce or Commerce activity that we're not going to start anything with Drupal 7 at this point, and we will wait like until the next summer um, or beginning of the year, so to say, depending on the size of the project. We want to be uh, active very early on with Drupal Commerce too, uh, but at the moment we're not doing anything. Um, so, well, I, I think the, um, there, there is the, there, we have a big dependency on, on, on these bigger projects, and, and I think the, the only one that's, that's really hurting, um, well, there, there's, there are panels, like one, that's one of the things that's kind of missing, and that's, um, and there's maybe Drupal Commerce, which is also like one very important but very specific application. And we see that a lot of other things can actually be done uh, very easily with a simple alternative. So for example, um, organic groups. It's a big solution that can do a lot of things. And maybe you don't need to have like managers inside of each group that manage the users with access and all of that. Um, so if all you need is a way to say, well, these users belong together in some kind of organization, uh, then you have an organization entity and you have an entity reference to that, end of story. And suddenly you have something that's much simpler. Um, and, and so I, I think this is the, the, kind of, the kind of approach that we see. Um, it makes a lot more sense to build custom code because custom code is clean. It's not hook form alter this, hook form alter that anymore. It's really I create my own controller, my own service, and then I integrate it. And it doesn't need to be a lot of code. Um, and I think that we're going to see that like, people will stop being scared of custom code. Custom code is not a bad thing. It just means that it's very specific and it can do things very well. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that we will see a lot of those big monolithic uh, modules that will be replaced by more targeted solutions. Yes. So the, the, the problem with Drupal 8 is that um, on installation, uh, there is a, a unique site ID that is generated, and it's random. 
Um, and this site ID is used to generate the hashes of all the configuration files that you will create. And this means that you can't uh, just import the configuration if, uh, if it was not created as part of the same installation. So what we did, at, like, well, what I think everybody did in the early phases was to just have a database dump that you would reimport everywhere. Um, that's not really practical. And now there's the config installer. Um, it's, a, it's an installation profile, but it's a contrib installation profile that will just load what you have in configuration, uh, well, in your configuration folder, and we'll load that on installation. And so it pretty much provides you with all the configuration. It, it, there are a few bugs that still need to be fixed, some details, but otherwise it works really well. Um, so the, what we have in our uh, Git repository, uh, we use the Drupal, com uh, the composer project of the, um, the Drupal composer uh, GitHub uh, thing. It's a, it's a composer template. So you say composer create this project and it will just create a, like, um, well, it means that Drupal core is not going to be part of, uh, part of your repository. It's going to be handled via composer. It means that uh, the country modules, libraries, all of that is not in there, but your custom code is in the, com in the repository. And the nice thing about Composer is that it installs in place. So you don't end up with any sim links that like, point to different places. Uh, so that's one thing that's really nice. And we also put the configuration into, uh, into Git. And so we just export everything, and then we use that on deployment. Um, so that's, that's what we have in there. There's not much else, any, any other files that we might want to have in there, but uh, yeah. So it's, it's something that, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to. There's a few things that, um, for example, um, it's difficult at the moment to deal with sandbox modules because they're not automatically handled by the, the Drupal packages implementation. But these are small details that, uh, are pretty easy to, to solve with one or two Google searches. Yes? Uh, we just did Drupal 8 project. Um, so that's, um, and I mean, we, we had to choose the right projects to start with. Like the first project that we did actually did not have a front end. It was like an application that used the seven theme as the front end theme. Um, and and um, so, y yeah, y you don't want to just go big without knowing anything about Drupal 8. Um, but it's, it, uh, well, what we're saying is really you learn very quickly. Um, and w I think it makes sense to get some expertise to make sure that you're starting your projects right. And so what we're doing whenever we're starting a new project with a team that hasn't worked with Drupal 8, we make sure that there is someone who has done it before who works with who works with them and to make sure, well, this is how Composer works, this is how you should do your deployment, and, and to be there to answer questions. Um, and actually, most of the question can be answered by just looking around. Um, and there's already a very good pool of, of, uh, of content uh, about how to do specific stuff in Drupal 8. And one thing that's really nice is that, well, there's a lot fewer things that you need to learn. You need to know how to create a plugin for example. And once you understand that, you can create a block, or uh, you can create a formatter, or you can create a widget, or an entity. Or, and, and then it pretty much just works the same way. And then um, there was uh, Wolfgang who showed earlier, well, coding for Drupal 8 is actually just knowing how to code PHP. Um, and yeah, you have a lot of interfaces of a lot of classes that you can extend all of that. but you have a system, and this means that you can really, just by looking at the code, looking at the examples, uh, not necessarily example module, but look at how the forum module is doing its breadcrumbs, and then you know how to do breadcrumbs. Uh, so it's, it's very easy, and it's a lot easier to copy and to reuse pieces of code, um, and that makes the learning process really a lot easier. Um, and so we see that it's, there's not much risk involved with, uh, with doing a Drupal 8 project with people who have not necessarily done a lot of them. Any other questions? Okay.
Thank you.